Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Connections. Today, I am joined by a truly remarkable singer. I have Patrick Daly. Very nice to see you, Patrick. Hi, Natasha. Great to see you, too. Um, I have to say, it was such an interesting, magical experience to see yourself, Daniel Emmett, and John Rison on the America's Got Talent screens, right? Um, what an incredible experience that was. So maybe we'll start there, and then we'll go back through your career. Um, what, what kind of call did you get to say, uh, come, come be the face of Terry Crews? Yeah, so... Um... The voice, I mean, sorry. <laughs> yeah, the voice, more so. He was his face. Um, yeah. I would say, so basically, uh, we've been, of course, I've seen America's Got Talent, you know, for all of this time, for years and years and years. And it's interesting. I was sort of watching the, uh, the deep fake Tom Cruise videos at different points, right? Um, seeing those things. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. And like, just kind of, and I'm not a big tech person, but I started sort of like going down a, like a couple of deep dives of deep fake, mm -hmm. if you will, the deep dive deep fake. That's funny. Anyway, I was going down that way and watching those things. And I then I saw that um, when I was kind of finding out about the company, about metaphysics too. While that's happening, um, I know people who have been on America's Got Talent um, and, you know, th those things are happening too. So, uh, and they're watching and I, and I was like, you know, sh could I do something like that? And, you know, it's always a thing as a, as a, as a concert singer, as a classical singer, um, should you do something like that? I was like, yeah, I don't know. Like if I did it, it would just need to make sense, mm. right? I didn't want to go in as an act, at least in my mind, I was like, I don't know if I, I mean, I think a great, a platform like that is great. I actually find a lot of value in it. Yeah. Like I said, I have friends who've done it, but I said, I don't know if I want to go in as an act, you know, those shows have approached, like not America's Got Talent specifically, but you know, thing people have said, oh, you should go on The Voice or you should do this. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, because that is just how we're conditioned in our training, right? So, but I'm thinking about these kinds of shows, but I'm also watching uh, and looking at who I will come to find out as metaphysic. Um, and then while I'm looking at them and seeing the cool stuff they're doing, they reach out to me or they're looking at me and saying what I'm doing. And they said, I think we, we have an idea. So their team reached out and said, hey, we have this idea for, uh, for our act and want to see if you want to be interested or would be involved. And I was like, now, and it's on, it's on America's Got Talent. I said, now this is how I can go in the door. This is how I can go in the door. I was yeah. asked to be on. I was, you know, you know, pursued in a sense. Uh, I said, now this could work. This, this will work. And, uh, and from there we went out to, uh, LA just uh, on the on the front end to do some rehearsal stuff and to do some fittings. Um, we really had to stay quiet about things. Nobody could really know we were there. That's so the hard part, right? <laughs> really funny. So I was like, you know, we just did some rehearsals and some fittings and and actually getting to know each other because um, myself and John had, actually I take that back. John and I had met. Okay. Uh, Daniel and I had not, but I had seen Daniel before of course you know from other things but i had not we had met so we had to come out and so we and you know we had a couple of zooms but it was like let's we need to rehearse this thing and make sure that we're set so yeah. we went out and did some rehearsals we got fitted and everything but while we're there um you know because we're not one of the acts that were going on that week people were like oh who are you with what are you with and we're just like oh we're just here we're just visiting <laughs> very big <laughs> So or, or I'm here to see another act and da, da, da. you're like, we have to do all of that. Yeah. Um, and then came back uh, our actual production, like show week and went full throttle. And so, and what you saw was the full throttle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So do you get to rehearse when you're rehearsing in front of the judges or no, that all the technical work comes first and you see them when it's the live show? We only saw them at the live show. Okay. And in fact, 
in our rehearsal show week, because they, they basically do a rehearsal. I want to get it right. And I also don't want to give away too much. <laughs> from the, uh, In our rehearsal, uh, who is there? They uh, You do have uh, Terry Cruz there. Oh, OK. Nice. So what but had to happen is he basically introduced in the rehearsal, he introduced Metaphysic. He did his script. And then he said, and then it went to the video. And then they said, oh, Miss, hey, Terry, we got to, we, we need you to go over here for a bit to do this interview. So they whisked him away while we did the performance. Oh, so it was even hidden from him then. So he never saw it. Now, he usually will see other acts, but he couldn't see our acts. And he act. did that authentic reaction. Yep. There we go. So I remember, and I don't wear my glasses on stage and I'm nearsighted. So, but he's like you know, <laughs> a few feet away. So when he comes back for the, you know, the, the, the mock judges re responses, their responses are also very bland. Hey, this is really cool and original. Hey, it <laughs> looks great. It's really, it's really awesome uh, what you all are doing. Like, keep going. Like, it was just very like, I enjoyed this so much. It was so generic. Yeah. So Terry, but I, but I remember he comes back after everything's done. He sees this, this, this big bald black guy, you know, <laughs> in, in his, in, in his face, and in, in, on, on the stage. So I, and I could see him kind of, even though I'm nearsighted, I can see him kind of tilting his head, like what? starting to say, "What's up here?" Yeah. What's happening? I don't know what happened, <laughs> but something happened. Okay. Hmm. Okay. I could see it. I was like, yes, I, yeah, yeah. I see, I, I see the eye. I, I get it. <laughs> Um, so he didn't see it. It was really cool. Yeah. So what you see there is um, what the real reactions were. Was his true reaction? Was everyone's true reaction? Um, and they 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 say Daniel, who had been on the show, of course, uh, you know, a few times, uh, was like, you know, there's there's nothing quite like that that energy there's nothing quite like the energy of the uh of the agt stage mm. it's um be, because the audience responds in such a way and it is a little bit i mean i think to me where and i could say well no i would throw it back a little bit because I, I like you know most people would say there's nothing like that energy because because of the the spaces in which they frequent or they've come up in and to me, it would, although it was different, it was something I was sort of, it was akin to um, responses that I've had growing up um, singing and training in the black church. Mm, okay. You open up your mouth to sing a no, and it's a certain thing, sing! Like you hit yes. the response, right? <laughs> and so I'm yes. used to that, you know, that, 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 like literally the call of my sound, the call of my ministry, what have you, whatever you call it, and the response. Yeah, I'm used to that. So it's like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> you know, like so, I'm an old ha like, ham at this. Like I know, guys. <laughs> so, like you, you're never gonna. You're, it's like it's so interesting, so different. I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> like, I, I, once we did, I was like, oh, honey, this is like church. Okay, keep going. <laughs> now the only thing is that I can't respond. You know, in a more, I can't like ham up my response. I still have to stay within the structure of the performance. Yeah. Yeah, it was a it was a very um, a similar sort of thing, and uh, and again to be on the show, the act and the performance that uh, Simon Cow called, um, you know, the best of the series. Yep. And the, and they were all so gracious. They were all so gracious. I mean, once we once we were moved off stage for commercial break, Simon got up. You know, he and his security, like he got up, he made his way. He wanted to see each and every one of us and really oh, wow. nice. engage. Um, you know, <laughs> when we went to the results show the following night, Heidi was uh, was upset. <laughs> she was like, what? She was like, why are you guys not on stage? Because we were like, we were just, we were, I said, we were just the talent. She was like, no, you all should have been on stage. I don't know. Like, she was upset. Like, <laughs> you know, um, of course. Terry was losing it when we met him backstage. He was like, like all of us, like, guys, oh my God. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was a, it was really a special experience. Um, and I'm very and I'm grateful for it. It's it to me, and I guess this will make in some way segue, to me, it is somewhat indicative of the 
I guess you would say somewhat abnormal and uh, uncharacteristic uh, or, or yeah, abnormal sort of um, untraditional, non-traditional career hmm. that I've had and I am having as a counter um, where, you know, there are the traditional things that get in there. And then there's some things that's like, nobody else does that. And that's okay. And that's good. Or, you know, like it, or the calls that you get are just different, right? It's, yeah. I, I, I'm very grateful, you know, for that. Well, again, it was such a cool experience, such a way to represent, I think, both opera and also kind of classical crossover. I, I just think in a, in a really good way. There's some, how do I say this? <laughs> There's some things that can be a little gimmicky. Like I really, you enjoy, I love crossover. This is my thing. But I think there's some things you can tell like the producers, I feel like, um, what's that group? Uh, G4, I think they asked them to sing, oops, I did it again. Was it that one? Mm -hmm. Or baby one more time. It just, it didn't seem like it wasn't their choice of song. You know, it was like the producers kind of had a heavy hand, but I think this was just, it was authentic. It was just a beautiful way to, to get the music out there. So what a great thing to be part of. And, you know, I will say that, and I'm not gonna say the name, because I don't, <laughs> I don't want John. No, to that's that. fine. But I will say that um, there is a very famous singer that um, that John. Well, I mean, of course, we all know people. But John, you said he was corresponding with. Um, he was like, yeah, I was corresponding with this particular singer, and sh and I and she saw our video, and she was she was so happy, and she wrote back how. Um, how we represented the industry and the field well, yep. and uh, that we all sounded great and yada, yada, yada. So it's like, when this person says that, I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> you know? So I think that because, and, I, and again, it is a, it, it was an opportunity. And I, this is what was so cool too. It wasn't just that we had, it wasn't just us on the, on the show. There was also, um, and I'm going to forget her name, and she's my baby, and I'm going to be really <laughs> upset. Um, and that's why I'm going to my phone to pull up my Do it. Instagram. I think that's the worst thing. So growing up, my father was a pastor, and I could never remember anyone's names. The worst thing you can have as a pastor's kid. <laughs> I'm really upset because I love her. Um, oh, I know what I'm going to do. Hold on. Uh, and I'm so Was glad she on an episode before you? She was actually on our episode. I think she was oh, on our okay. episode. Okay, yes. Is this it? Yes, okay. Marissa, that's it. Marissa Beddows. Marissa Beddows was also on the episode and was also on the show, you know. So two sort of classical crossover operatic acts yes. on the same episode. Um and she's great. Like, uh, you know, if you if you watch Marissa's stuff, she, you, you know, she's the girl that does. She's the uh, yeah, the girl that does all of the um, like vo vocal imitations. I haven't heard her. I'm gonna have to go listen to her after this. Yeah, now. check her out. She's all on on YouTube, all on Instagram. But Mar Marissa Beddows, but she Marissa was doing Beddows. all of those things, and so she started with the Omeo Babino Caro, and then it goes into like Celine and these other things. Oh, nice. So, I mean, great girl, great singer, just sweet as pie. Um, and so it was cool to have that. And I think there might have been another sort of act of sorts in that vein on the show. Um, I think that, and, and, you, and I will say this, although we were there only as, again, as, as talent, you know, we're not the act. Right. Um, Metaphysic is the act. Metaphysic is the team. And we really want to, like, make sure that that's clear. Um, they, how can I put it? It was really also great to sort of be, to feel connected to that, um, to the AGT, as they call it, the AGT family. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have the rehearsals with the team and the producers and they were really wonderful, really wonderful. And then also the other acts and the other contestants. Um, I, I mean, uh, Acapop is the name of the group. Um, these uh, acapella kids mm -hmm. from all over the country, they're amazing. And I was like, okay, so all of you are my babies. Like, I'm adopted. <laughs> I, I love kids. I'm, I mean, I'm a teacher I mean, and an educator. So I'm, uh, uh, so I'm like, okay, so you, oh, come here. No, you're mine. <laughs> I'm adopting you. And I, I told one of the little kids, I told his dad, I was like, 
So just so you know that this is my this is my child. And he was like, <laughs> so I He's like, please take him and mentor him, please. And yeah, I was like, no, this is mine. This is my baby right here. I, I was like, it's just like me. I remember it. So I, I I loved it was really great. You know, it was a great, great experience. And again, something unique. And the other thing is, of course, I couldn't tell people. So, you know, they were like, okay, so you can't really say anything what you're doing. So what I did was, but I said, okay, can we do this? So I said, all right, here we go. I will <clears throat> message my friends. So I have a choral group back in Nashville uh, called the W Crim Singers, AKA Wakanda Corral. And uh, the Crim Singers, when our big group chat, I said, hey, you all. So I, you know what I've been doing. Y'all know I've been going to LA. I can't tell you what I'm doing, but tune in to America, uh, not America, tune in to NBC at 7 Central. <clears throat> I did that. I said, tune in to NBC at 7 Central. And they were like, what? Huh? I just, I said, that's all I can say. <laughs> that's all I can say. Tune in to NBC at 7 Central. And once I did that, everybody was like, oh my God, that's what you call it. Patrick, are you on? I can't say just tune in what's happening oh my god they're freaking out <laughs> they are losing it and then they watched it they're like ah. and so i said <laughs> once you tune in you can tell other people to tune in too and say that you'll see us like that's how we'll spread it and that's the only way that people knew <laughs> now that must be really hard to keep though because you just like it's, it's this amazing thing and you just gotta sit on it it's like i i couldn't say anything i mean my grandmother uh who just turned uh 95 last month at the top of November, uh, you know, I couldn't say anything to her. Everybody's like, why do you keep going out to LA? In fact, that same choral group, the, the Crim Singers, we had our fifth anniversary concert, uh, August, it was like, I will say August 27th. So whatever that, yeah, it was that last Sunday in August. So we had our fifth anniversary concert, beautiful concert, packed out house, you know, great time. As soon as our concert was over, I was headed to the airport. Oh, wow. Okay. Concert started at four. My flight was at 727. We ended at about 536 o'clock. You were booking it to the airport. Yeah, I, I said, I am so glad I'm TSA pre-check. I'm so glad I've checked in already. All I need to do is drop off these bags. I have, a, unfortunately, a friend of mine that works at, at the airport, <laughs> works at uh, the airline I was taking. He was there, and I was like, hey run these bags through. He was like, don't worry, I got you. And I was headed out and we were, we were set. So that's, you know, that's how it goes. Yeah. But I feel like these amazing opportunities that come, it's because you've put in the work before, right? So let's go back to, you mentioned singing in church. So I'm guessing that's, that was your background is your training was in church. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in the words of one of my good uh, colleagues, uh, and collaborators, Dr. Alicia Lola, jo Lola Jones, a really, really brilliant ethnomusicology, ethnomusicologist, seminarian, um, a professor, a musician herself, and singer, fine, verified singer as well. Um, and it's not just her, but you know, I, I we talk about it a lot. The Academy of the Black Church, mm -hmm. that is the rearing of so many, um, so many artists. You know, so that I mean you mentioned yourself, like okay, your dad was a pastor and all of these things, but I think there is a particular um training and a, and a, I don't want to say a, I didn't even say a specialized training, but a particular sort of uh experience that is held within the black church training, mm -hmm. um, which is actually very vast, right? Because and so so and it and, and it's it's vast. It may depend on region. Mm -hmm. It can often can depend on region. It can depend on denomination, um, things of that nature. So, I'm growing up in the in in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, oh, music. place of music, anyways. Yeah. Right. You know, and, <laughs> and there's an effect, and there, there and there's a reason that's important. And I'll bring up too, um, for me, uh, shortly. But I'm growing up in Nashville again, Music City, and having, and growing up in a church, growing up in a community, so, um, and I always do this, and I should start like this, I am the great grandson of West Tennessee sharecroppers. My Pearl and Daddy Fred Slocum, uh, my mother, 
in 1966 came to what was then Tennessee A&I State University uh, and the first in her family to go to college. And there, uh, while at Tennessee State, she met my father. Uh, they married soon after she graduated in 1970. Was this, yeah, 1970 and uh, stayed in Nashville. My, as I mentioned, my grandmother, who is 94, my grandmother, Freddie Mae Levy, I'm sorry, she's 95 now. And Freddie Mae, um, who we call, whom we call Medea, she <laughs> is, and we've called her Medea. So before Tyler Perry. Okay. <laughs> because, and again, and that's, a, and you know, there's sort of the, because um, we have to also think about like the language in which, in, in, in which often is used. So Medea is sort of a, uh, a, a, an amalgamation of my dear. Okay. Yeah. That's where that comes from. So like, my dear, my dear, my dear, my dear, my dear. And so we just call it that. So we that's what it's been forever. And that's like, so that's a common, um, very common. I didn't know that. I just knew it from Tyler Perry. That's so yeah, interesting. It's, a, it's okay. very common in, uh, in, in African-American uh, parlance. I mean, I think, uh, especially if you, if you, I forgot the guy's name on, uh, on, on TikTok and on YouTube, who talks a lot about linguist linguistics, um, his whole hashtag is, is has, his hashtag is we out here, but he talks a lot about how we've kind of combined, uh, uh, our, uh, our language usage so that we can express various things. Right. So mm -hmm. that is, so that's one part. So Medea, Freddie Mae is, she never studied, but uh, she is is still what one would call the, a high note soprano. So during sort of the golden age, what we think of as the golden age of gospel, um, there you know people still sang with a, an understanding of registration. Yeah. So that's why you hear sort of and 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 and, and an understanding of line too. So you still hear Mahalia Jackson you know, with a very rich tone all the way through, right? Yep. Open throats, fully supported. You will listen to Marian Anderson, I'm not Marian Anderson, but Marian Williams, uh, another great gospel artist of that golden age. She may have a grit, but she it was nothing for her to pop up to sing some high notes and spin, right? There was always, in a lot of those groups, the caravans, the Roberta Martin singers, um, uh, like uh, we can keep on going. There was always the uh, high note soprano. And in the with and, and you know you get who are my girls? Oh my goodness, the uh, the Barrett sisters, right? They 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 were all based they all basically were sopranos, but uh, they was all they they all had that <laughs> kind of sound like all of that. So my grandmother is that, um, still at ninety five can still wow. sing. Uh, that's what's so great. So I come from you know those folks. And I grew up in a church where what was beautiful is that we sort of had the full um, expression of Black gospel music and Black sacred mm -hmm. music. Um, we didn't sing as much of the anthems traditions, but the, what was the senior choir, also known as choir number one, the senior choir would sing hymns and they sang hymns straight up out of the hymnal. Okay. They read the hymn, all four parts. Okay. <laughs> they could do because also a lot of these same folks um, went to schools, went to college. I would also, this, this, this is also understood that, and I would talk to my mother about this a lot, uh, even during, um, during the time of Jim Crow and of segregation in this country, um, there are not as many options in a sense, I'll just say it like that, and then the options in a sense for uh, educated black musicians. Yeah. So, in fact, I knew a woman. There's a uh, there's a there's a lady in Nashville. Um, I met because her daughter is a board member of a or a former board member of a board I'm on, and she was like, "Oh yes, I went to New England Conservatory, and I was in school with Coretta Scott, and I remember when Martin King would a young Martin King would come pick her up from the dorms at NEC." And I was like, oh, wow. oh. <laughs> we, uh, Coretta and I studied with the same teacher. And, you know, <clears throat> we learned, you know, all of these roles. We probably learned about 60, 70 roles. We have all these roles that we learned, but where were we going to sing them? Yeah. So because we weren't, she said, oh, I didn't have a place to sing them. So I wanted to church music. 
and others went into church music and others went into education. So that's why what will often happen is some of the segregated schools, mo many, most of the segregated schools um, around the country had some of the best choirs and mm -hmm. voice teachers and conductors and organists the schools and the churches had these people because that is where we could go to do our craft. Um, that also is where you start to, and it's not, I'm not to say it's where you start, but in part, that is very much directly linked to the uh, anthem and high church tradition musically of the black church, um, where you have uh, churches such as Abyssinian Baptist Church in New York, Ebenezer in Atlanta, uh, friendship in Atlanta, uh, churches in black churches in Chicago, Third Baptist Church in San Francisco, you know, many of these black churches and AME churches in particular as well, uh, African Methodist Episcopal, having hundreds, hundred year long traditions now of like presenting Handel's Messiah or mm -hmm. um, Du Bois' Seven Last Words, uh, even uh, Mendelssohn's Elijah, like these are regular occurrences. Yeah. Right? So then you, so you compound that also with um, the people who learn by rote, learning, uh, who just have the natural talent. Yeah. So there are people, I know a few people who can play, they're like, they're saying, oh, you're singing Lift Up Your Hands today? Okay, I know that, I know it. You need to score? No, I don't read. But they will play Lift Up Your Heads or Your Gates, you know, Ashford perfectly. Yeah. Because they learned it by rote. And they can improvise on it, so it's better than what Bach could ever do, right? Yeah. You know, it, it's it, 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 so we have that. And I grew up in a space where all of that was available. So the first lady of my church at that time, uh, uh, Mother Lily Bell Herring, she went to Tennessee A and I and was a voice major, uh, and was a, and still had that beautiful floaty soprano. She led the senior choir, um, so they and they read out of the hymnal. And then you had the uh, young adult choir and they were doing the more contemporary things, right? Uh, <laughs> they were singing the things by uh, by John P. Key and Fred Hammond and Martin, uh, not Martin King, good Lord, uh, Kirk Franklin. Um, they were singing that. And then you had the children's choir, of course, which is what I was in. And I was three years old and uh, I was at my nanny's house. So one, my nanny was one of the mothers of the church, Mother Martha Long. Um, so my, my mother went, started going back to work. Um, Mother Long and her daughter, Linda, and her husband, um, Ben, they sort of took me in. And I was the first boy that nanny kept. Um, <laughs> I'm very proud of that. And so she, uh, the, and because she was very influential in our church. And I was three years old. Mother Long is listening to me sing. So what she did, she called everybody. She called my, she called my play auntie Mary, who was one of, who ran the children's, uh, I think she ran the children's choir at the time and she called other people and she had everybody stop what they were doing to listen to me sing at three. Oh, wow. He, like listen to this boy sing. And so she said, okay, now he's going to be in the children's choir. <laughs> and they said, well, mama, mother long, we don't take him to their five. She's like, I don't care. He's going to be in the children's choir. So <laughs> she, had she there. saw it in you, yeah. She put, she put that there. She was like, "You're gonna do it." Um, and their family was where there were many of them were singers too. So she was like, "No, he's gonna sing." So I'm starting to sing in the in the children's choir at three, um, and from there I was in uh, and I was in like different children's choirs in the city in Nashville. Um, I think this is sort of where I. I sort of divert and talk a little bit about the importance of music education in schools because mm. I went to national public schools and I went to national public schools on purpose. My mother, um, her career was in, as she is, she's an educator for over 40 years, um, a, led, a leading educator. Uh, she and her classmates at Tennessee State um, as student teachers integrated um, the a, a very old money side of town, Bell Mead and West Mead. She, they integrated those schools as student teachers, um, and so she under and she understood the magnitude of arts education for young people. So she also sent me to schools. Like although we grew, I lived in, I live and grew up in the suburbs. She sent me to schools in 
East Nashville in the urban spaces because she wanted me to really, for one, to also, to yes, be able to be connected to community, but two, because she there was a village there. Mm. A lot of some of those teachers, some of those principals, there were teachers at uh, Tom Joy, was it Tom Joy? No, yeah, Tom Joy Elementary, uh, my first elementary school. There were teachers who literally had been at the hospital and come to see my mother and I when I was born. Oh, wow. Um, uh, uh, Miss Rose. And I can, oh my goodness, I'm going to be upset. I can't I don't know why my mind is doing this. Yeah, but anyway, but there are two teachers. I'm putting you on the spot here. That's why. <laughs> no, no, I, I just was going there, but no, it's not you. But there were just two, there were at least two. And then there were others who my mother maybe had mentored or they were in a community together. They may have gone to, if they didn't go to TSU together, they went to TSU at a certain point. Um, they might have been Sawraws, right? My mother's an AKA, so they might have been Sawraws. And if they weren't Sawraws, well, they, you know, all the, all the Greeks know each other. So, it, you know, it was all of that. So I had a village. So she wanted to ensure that I had my village and my and my uh, and my space, but also being able to be in community uh, mm -hmm. with my folks um, and never to lose that touch. So the issue comes though that at this time we're seeing arts education be tussled with. Yeah. So though I though, though there were music teachers in the schools, well maybe we if we have a music class instead of it being a choir or band, this is going to be a general class. Yeah. Now, oh, well, maybe we go to some schools and there won't be it at all. I got to middle school and I went to my zone school at the time. And I think they, we had music a bit and then we didn't have it at all. And for somebody who loved music and also loved dance and theater, because my minor ended up in high school and college being um, dance and oh, dance station. Nice. Um, as somebody who loved all these things, that wasn't available to me all the time. So we did find other avenues in the city to be able to be a part of. I was a part of uh, what's called the uh, Celebration Youth Chorus, which is an offshoot of the what is called the Met M E T Singers okay. uh, Choral Arts Link, led by a, a wonderful woman, um, Margaret Campbell Holman, to ensure that uh, to ensure great choral music education to Nashville public school children. And so I was in, and I was in her groups coming up. Uh, and then of course, coming in my middle school, like that was tough. That was a tough period because there wasn't much music and being the different kid, being the little, the little boy. And I see just when you're in middle school and you're like starting to figure out who you are. Um, you're having emotions about, you know, about, uh, about your sexuality and about your body and about this and that. And this is like, it's so much happening. And I, yeah. and I didn't really have the artistic outlet and the creative outlet to help me through that. Yeah. Um, I'm very grateful though, that I had, there were great, um, there was a great counselor whose name I again, cannot recall. Um, but I was able to have that name with him and I, and he's made, he's passed away, uh, a few years back. So I'll just say, and I'll say to him, um, you know, he, he, he was, he was really a rock. There was, a, but there was also not only him that had a play auntie that was also a teacher at that school. Right. So I, I was, I was, you know, again, kept really well within that village. Fortunately, I did go to the national school of the arts. Um, and coming into that space where that was high school, sorry, high school. Okay. And so now coming into that space, I'm, getting further connected to, yes, the, it took, I'll say it like a couple of ways. I'm getting connected to a lot of the young people who are, are extremely talented. Mm. Like they're so talented, but also a lot of these young people, again, all, a lot of us, especially the, 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 the black students were coming from the black church. Um, you know, they, some of them had all grown up in some of the same churches and they had groups. Um, and then I eventually had a gospel group too during that time. Um, what was the name of your group? Oh, my, the name of the group was, we were called Shabak Praise. Okay. We were called Shabak Praise and we were, we were cute. We were, uh, I, it is funny. <laughs> this is all going to make sense. I've always loved choirs. Um, even in high school, uh, I was the, 
I guess you could say I was like the student conductor of our magical singers. Yeah. And okay. It, it was a, and so there, there were different groups then, like the groups have shifted because it's a new director and new directors. So they kind of changed the, the structure, but our top group at the time was magical singers, you know, you know, very chambered group. And I ended up being the student conductor of that. And that's a funny story. That was a whole long thing of me <laughs> being this little ambitious kid and, um, and uh, almost arrogant, quite arrogant um, as a freshman in high school. Like I deserve to be in this. I deserve, and I didn't get in it. So I was like just saying all sorts of stuff. I was, it was wild. Um, but he, but Mr. Graham eventually did see, you know, my promise and my aptitude for certain things. And so I conducted the group a few times. And when we went to festival, I conducted the group. And lo and behold, they said, and for best student uh, uh, collaborator, accompanist or something like that, Patrick Daly. And I was like, oh. <laughs> You know, then, I didn't even know this is happening. Yeah. So I've always loved groups. I've always loved choirs. Um, and the intention of Shabak Praise was originally to be a chorale. I wanted a, a choir. I've always, I believe in sort of uniting voices, uniting mm -hmm. purposes, again, building community through singing. And that was the goal. Well, I, I tried to get everybody, I had everybody's number. I was like, come on, y'all, let's go to this one rehearsal. Well, that first person, I think maybe eight people showed up. Fine. <laughs> and it got down to where it was like six of us. But that six became exactly what we needed. Um, yep. And so we didn't have to be a choir. We could be a really clean ensemble. We didn't always have instrumentalists. So we really heightened our... Um, we really heightened our skills as for acapella singing, even three, four, five parts, what have you. But we heightened that to, you know, to make it make sense in the spaces that we were going into. And there was interest from the gospel industry, uh, a lot of interest there. <clears throat> and then I said, well, I'm going to college. And part of why I even mentioned, you know, that whole thing of Nashville being so important Nashville is home of Fisk University. Yes, it's home of Tennessee State, American Baptist College, Meharry Medical College, but it's also home of Fisk University. And Fisk University is home of the Fisk Jubilee Singers, a choral group uh, that was formed to save their school. Okay. Fisk, the Fisk Jubilee Singers were formed um, by the, the treasurer and music teacher at Fisk at the time in the eight, like 18... Well, Jubilee Day is October 6, 18, is, was the day that we celebrated is October 6, 1871, which, if I'm not mistaken, is the day that the singers set out for their European tour, oh, wow. um, which I'll get into in a second. But um, they, and you have to understand too, Fisk is founded, Fisk is founded uh, at the Fisk School, 1866. Uh, my alma mater, I'm, I'm actually I'm not going to get to that yet. Fisk is founded 1866. <laughs> Um, the Civil War has ended 1865, right? Shaw University, I think, is founded in North Carolina, is founded 1865 itself. And then if there are other and other HBCUs that are founded before the Civil War um, and other those at schools, they're usually in the North. So you have the Africa Institute, um, which becomes Cheney University in Pennsylvania. Um, Wilberforce University, founded by the uh, out of the AME Church uh, in Wilberforce, Ohio, uh, 1856. So, and I'm missing somebody. I know people are going to be like, "Oh my God, you missed my school!" And I'm pissing you off. <laughs> Don't fight me, y'all. It's early. Um, <laughs> no, I know this. I'm literally the culture. Anyway, so um, so Fisk University being founded by the uh, American Mission uh, uh, American Missionary Association. Um, sort of to assist the newly freed Blacks. And it's also out of the Freedmen's Bureau, right? So it's all connected to assist these newly freed um, uh, enslaved folks from formerly enslaved people to get an education. So people are coming from everywhere. And the treasurer, uh, George White, a white man from, uh, 
from New York. Uh, he said, well, maybe we can put together a choir because the school is getting, we're losing funds. Maybe we can put together a choir. And initially he puts together a group of singers, uh, including a young woman named Ella Shepard Moore. Ella Shepard is very important um, as she was, and she's very important, but she has a story in which um, she was actually, she was about to sort of have a similar fate to that, which is the topic of um, Beloved by Toni Morrison and of, um, of, uh, of Margaret Garner, um, the opera that Toni Morrison was the librettist for by Richard Daniel Poor, um, in which her mother intended to to, to drown herself and her baby. Yeah. Because she said, my baby will not be born in, born in, in, uh, born in slavery. Yep. And as she's going to do this, a woman, an old woman kind of comes from out of nowhere and says, no, you can't do this because that child is going to sing before kings and queens one day. Wow. And saves this, and saves the life of that. So Ella Shepard um, is one of the, is really one of those singers and not just one of the singers, one of those leaders. Yep. And, she uh, and so she and the other singers, they under under George White's uh, leadership, they're learning the great masterworks. They're singing Mozart and Palestrina. You know, also it's important to note that at this time, the U.S. does not have a real musical identity, right? So all the music that 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 the the United States at the time is 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 promoting and is performing is all from the uh is all from Europe. And so they're like, okay, here's this, here's the here's Mozart and Palestrina, the things that we know. Yeah. Well, it wasn't doing anything. Like they would do concerts and nobody <laughs> wanted to hear it. Except. As the story goes, uh George White, the students are amongst themselves in a basement at Fisk, and they're singing. George White, and they're singing spirituals to themselves. They're just like remembering old times. He kind of hears them, he overhears them, and then he says, hey, y'all, we need to sing these. Let's put them mm -hmm. in concert form and sing these as, as choral concert form. And they're like, they're initially resistant. No, we don't want to sing those songs. We don't want to remember that. We want to like, that should be private and sacred. Well, he convinces them, and with the help of Ella Shepard Moore, who eventually is that because her name was she marries, um, with the help of Ella Shepard Moore, compiles and arranges the songs. And so now you have the first iteration of the concert Negro Spiritual. Wow. And the group literally set out to save their school. And you know, making the long story short, which I've already made long. They do, history, so. <laughs> they, well, good because that's also a big part of what I do. I love talking about this. Um, but yeah, so they they do save their school. On the seal of Fisk University are the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Wow. Okay. Um, there is a hall. The first uh, building erected in the southeast and sort of in our region um, for the education of African Americans is Jubilee Hall, and it uh, constructed in completed in 1873 uh, and it's beautiful. I mean, and and so, and I bring that date, that 1860s one date up um, and, I'm, and I'll probably mess it up. So Fisk guys don't be mad at me, <laughs> but they set sail, they set sail for Europe. They do a tour all over Europe and they are singing in London and they are requested for an audience with Queen Victoria. And now this is, again, this is sort of the fable. This is sort of the, the narrative story. It's not exactly true, but we like <laughs> to put it out. We just like to say it. But they sing for Queen Victoria. And she, as the, as the story goes, now again, it's not exactly true. As the story goes, she asks, oh, from where are these singers from? And before anyone could answer, she responds, well, that must be the that that is a very musical city, or that must be the music city of the U.S. Now, that is what they like to say. Again, it's not entirely true, but what is true is the fact that the Fish Jubilee Singers are truly the first ambassadors for what will become American music. Mm. So it is m m black singers, many of whom, most of whom, were formerly enslaved who took their music and took their experiences, 
put them into a form that could be that that was translatable and that was uh, relatable to these audiences. Yeah. And sings them like the the way that they they describe this their singing of Steal Away is that they sang it so straight tone and pure as if it was Gregorian chant. Okay, wow. And so this those so those singers set out and saved their institution and now introduced the world to to truly to America's first music. And in fact, yeah. Antonin Dvorak who says to Harry T. Burley as we keep going down the line, you know, when he's brought in to the American Conservatory to help the 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 American Conservatory in New York, he's brought in and says, well, you need to help us find our sound. And he becomes friends and mentors and is also taught in a sense by Harry T. Burley. And he says, well, if, if you all want to find your, your true sound, you need to look to the music of the formerly enslaved, of the Negro and of the indigenous. Yeah. That's it. So I grew up in Nashville wanting to be in that tradition. The Jubilee Singers are still existing. Um, I must say a special um, ashe to their uh, di for their late director, Dr. Paul T. Kwame. He made transition this this fall. And so, but I grew up wanting to be one of those singers. They were so poised. And so, and I loved how they presented very clean and they, and, and, and I just, I watched them and just in awe. And I wanted to be one of those singers. But then something happened. Uh, not only did I, I, I was started to get in, interested in other black college choirs. So I heard the Morehouse College Glee Club. I heard Dillard University. Um, out of a uh, concert choir out of uh, New Orleans. I heard all these different groups. And then came a tour from a college choir out of Baltimore, the Morgan State University Choir. And they came to a church right outside of Nashville. I heard these voices and I was blown away. Hmm. And not only was I blown away by the full voices of that choir, there were three voices that stuck out. Three men came out singing high. They were countertenors. And I said, what, my mouth was dropped. Eyes were bugged out, but just open. I said, that's me, that's my sound. I heard myself for the first time. Wow, well, yep. And so it was like, well, Fisk is great, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going there. I'm going, I don't know. I, I don't, I've never been to Baltimore. I don't know anything about it, but whatever that is, I'm going there because I hadn't heard singing like that and I had not seen myself in a way like that. And at that same concert, uh, this organization, Salama Urban Ministries, was a, was a presenter and a sponsor of the concert of bringing this choir. And comes out this man who is, uh, who's very, who's very statuesque and, uh, and refined that he talks about his relationship to the Morgan Choir and their director, Dr. Their late director, Dr. Nathan Carter, um, and and what they do at Salama and how they raise young people to be uh, great and this kind of thing. So as I'm saying to myself, God, I hear myself. I hear my voice. I think I, that is the place I could be. My mother's saying when that man is speaking, God, I pray that my son gets to work with that man. Mm -hmm. So fast forward. I'm back at my high school and I'm back in the NSA and one of my little sisters, Christina Ray, who actually is, um, she was third place on America's Got Talent a couple of seasons back. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, beautiful singer, can sing anything. She said, hey, Pat, you know, everybody knows you want to be a Jubilee singer. You want to go to Fisk. My nickname was Bishop Jubilee. <laughs> um, everybody knows this. So you need, so we're doing the gospel at Colonus at Fisk, her aunt. Uh, Persephone Felder Fentress is and was the head of theater at Fisk. She said, come and do this show with us. I was like, heck yeah. And I go in there to the audition room, to the uh, rehearsal room, and who was sitting there at the table is that man that my mother prayed I would work with. That man is William G. Krim. That man became my voice teacher. He transitioned me from tenor to countertenor. Um, 
He prepared me for all of the major competitions I did, the NAACP AXO, the uh, Grady Ray and Prize in Sacred Music from the Negro Spiritual Scholarship Foundation, NFAA Arts, uh, everything I did. He prepared me for all of those, prepared me for all of my college auditions and sent me with intentionality, with purpose to Morgan State. Mm -hmm. um, and now all of the ending of after finishing at Morgan and then going to Boston University for my master's where I studied with Penelope Beatsis and, you know, had the opera training, got some early music stuff in there. And, you know, Boston's an interesting time. I'm going to keep moving on past her. <laughs> moving back to Nashville and now serving on faculty with him at Tennessee State. Oh, wow. And it was it was he who asked me to put some singers together for a freedom school program that the United Methodist Church was holding. And that group became the W. Crim Singers, AKA Wakanda Corral. So that is the, that's much of it. I just went that through a whole circle. circle. I love that. <laughs> and I mean, tell me a little bit more about that process though, because I feel like counter tenors are so rare um, and not just because of the voice, but probably because people don't know what to do with them. So finding that person was so instrumental. So what was that process? You, you, you heard it, you knew it, but what was it like actually working with him and, and getting into that repertoire? And Well, it made sense. And one of the things about Mr. Krim, he's, uh, he, like all good teachers should be, listens to the traits of what their students have. Mm. Um, Although I'm a, like in my mode of voice, I'm a tenor. I always sang high. If there was a, an Aretha song, I was going to sing it. If there was a Penny <laughs> song, I was going to sing it. If there's a Gladys Knight, Shaka Khan, Whitney Houston, Mariah song, I was going to sing it. I was not as interested in singing the songs by Luther Vandross and Donnie McClurkin, or rather Donnie Hathaway, but also Donnie McClurkin or um, any of the other guys, Stevie Wonder. Like, I love it, but it's like, I'm not as interested in singing that. I wanted yeah. to sing what they were singing. And so the same thing came when I get to NSA and I was like, I kind of want to sing what they're singing. I guess I'm going to sing this tenor stuff, but I want to sing what they're singing. So he recognized that. So the first thing he does is he said, well, let's line the whole voice up because that's what you're singing anyway. It just makes sense. Yeah. So he pulls me in the car room, into, not a car room, but into my into the first lesson. And he says, okay, sing C. Yeah. And I'm like, sing it. I said, he, C. He's like, no, no, no. Head first. C. Okay, let's go. And go. C. And we just keep going. Good. You're going to sing counter tenor. We're going to line the whole voice up. Okay. That's what we're doing. Um, and I would also say, too, it wasn't, and he was he was the first foundation of, like, my counter tenor. He yeah. immediately switched me. There were other teachers before. I had a great teacher uh, who was a former Jubilee singer because that was my whole mindset. <laughs> I'm going to be a Jubilee singer. And I will say, not to besmirch Jubilee singers, but there is this idea to the teacher at the time at Fisk, um, although I did not study with her, and she's still, and she's very wonderful, old school Latvian European teacher, Western, you know, Eastern European, like great technique. Those singers that I studied with her are top notch. Yeah. But there is this idea in a lot of schools of singing that counter tenor is not a real voice. Mm. So if I would have gone to Fisk, I probably would not be doing what I'm doing. And I would be finding having to get to the journey later. And I have colleagues who are like, Patrick, I'm like, what do you do? Because I, I really should have been this. I was like, I know, but your teacher believed differently. Yeah. And that is something that I've actually even come up, you know, and encountered. I was telling a, a mentee of mine last night about when I was doing different competitions and, you know, there would be three judges, two would probably just love me. Like, oh, you're perfect. You're this, this, and this. And then one would be like, you did very fine. I, I literally remember, and I'm going to say it because I'm a, I'm a part of a member. There was one from a Nats competition yep. um, where a judge wrote, you're doing fine for this false voice you're singing in. Okay. Like, that's what you're going to write to somebody, a young person? Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So your so your biases and your your issues decided to get into this. You should be talking and commenting about my technique. Is the technique right? Am I singing? Am I on the breath? Am I on the body? That I did what fixed the diction then? Like, but that's not what you need to talk about. That's that that's a problem. And yeah. and I'm not trying to get upset about it, but <laughs> it, we but we have to recognize those things. So I had a teacher, 
a black man who heard what I was doing, heard who I was and affirmed it. That was so big. Yeah. I had a mother who was like, whatever he needs to do, let's do it. So I have a village and a support system that invested in my development. Um, and uh, so he, again, he just took me through it and he gave me, that's why, again, it's always so full circle. He gave me, let's see, some of the first things he gave me, Veritin Tuto Amor from 24 Italian Arias, of course. Uh, I was already singing Deep, Harry T. Burley's Deep River, but now we switched it to countertenor for me. And uh, something else I'm going to miss. Oh, Andy Muzik, uh, Schubert. And uh, O Thou the Telescotinus Design from Messiah. Basically, he gave me the blueprint of everything that I would eventually be singing. <laughs> right? I had Handel, I had Baroque. I had the, you know, the Italian art song and the, the Italian operatic repertoire. I had this German lead, although I'm singing more Bach stuff, you know, that's still important to get that there. And then I have the Negro spiritual, which is so important to me. So he intentionally chose things that I would relate to as a person, but also that could stretch and build my artistry. Mm. Um, Mr. Mr. Krim is very intentional like that. And I try to be intentional like that with my students. Like, okay, well, you grew up like this. So let me see if I pull you into this. Well, you like this kind of music or this kind of thought. Let me give you this, right? Just so it makes it, 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 it makes it make sense. Yeah. And so he did like, he's done like that with all of us again. So that young lady, Christina Ray, she's a, she's a, we call ourselves Krim kids. She's a Krim kid too. Uh, there are a lot of us who are out in the field, a beautiful, another beautiful soprano, uh, Cianne Wilson, who is, uh, she's uh, doing uh, Disney shows all over the country and all over the world as, you know, the princesses, right? This black girl singing all of them. She's a creme kid. Like we, there's a lot of us out here because he was so intentional with each of us mm. and did not, and his whole thing was, he wasn't necessarily trying to make us opera singers, but he always wanted us to have good technique and he wanted us to be disciplined. So his whole point was son, sweetness, darling, whatever he called you, <laughs> just get connected. Make sure you sing the line, make sure you stay focused, make sure you do all of these things. So that way the body will relate, the body will remember, can, you know, that's the, our dance director, Dr. Peter Fields. We had a whole trifecta. We had Dr. Peter Fields with dance, uh, Persephone Felder Fentress with theater, William Krim with music and singing. I mean, it, ugh, we're set, right? <laughs> and they all talked about the muscle, getting the mm. mu muscle memory, kinesthetic memory, muscle memory, muscle memory. So now, no matter what oh. you sing, the technique will be consistent. That was the point. So that old, and he was old school. He was a protege of, um, or he is, or was a protege of uh, Anna Koskas. He went to uh, Eastman at 16. He was a protege. Wow. He went to Eastman at 16. As a child in St. Louis, his piano teacher was Donnie Hathaway. Um, he And again, he goes to Eastman, and then he's also mentored and uh, and 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 trained with uh, uh, William Warfield, right? He's uh, he sings uh, bass roles all over Europe, and then he comes back to the U.S. still singing, but then gets into corporate America. That has a theological has a, a degree from Colgate Seminary. Um, I mean, just a brilliant man, just a brilliant man. He is he's we call him Pops. We love him, um, <laughs> and so. Like having that kind of teacher, again, who yep. sees you, who heard you, who wanted to affirm every gift in you and always lift you up. It, it you know, it's it, it's been so important. And uh, it, and because I've had teachers like him and not just him, there were other teachers that I had at Morgan and others, but, you know, I'm always trying to, you know, be in that lineage. Yep. And, and keep that thread artistically and 
yeah, artistically and uh, and as a teacher, as a mentor, as a creative, um, I do feel in many ways that there's a mantle that he kind of passed along to many of us. Um, you know, a lot of the work that I do, even being at Tennessee State and founding what is called the Big Blue Opera Initiatives. And the Big Blue Opera Initiatives is an opera outreach training performance fundraising program to support Tennessee State students, uh, area, regional, and even national HBCUs, underrepresented communities in opera to redefine what opera is and who it's for. I love that. And with the Big Blue Opera Initiatives, we have guest artist residencies, vocal masterclass series, but also our biggest thing is our Harry T. Burley Spirituals Festival, which was founded in 18, in, not 18, sorry, 2016 to commemorate Burley's 150th birthday. And we just continued it every year to talk, to do a different subject and a different topic around the Negro spiritual, around black music and its relationship to culture and society in some way, in the field in some way. So we have that and um, even the Crim Singers, right? So there is a powerful mantle that I am humbled and grateful to wear um, through so many people, some of whom I will, whose names I know and some of whose names I don't know. And sort of to borrow from that quote of Maya Angelou, I come as one and I stand as 10,000. So whenever I walk into a room, whenever I present at a conference, whenever I'm on any stage, it's my ancestors, it's my community, it's that village, it's those students that I'm working with that I know and I don't know. Um, and the goal is always to build with all of them in mind, with all of them as the focal point. Um, it's like none of this that I do is ever for me. Mm. Oh, like, oh, this is great. Like, this is you, like, no, I, like, I'll like I'll be taken care of because I'm because I'm living and operating on purpose, but my purpose is always to serve. And so, as the old hymn says, my grandmother's favorite hymn: "If I can help somebody as I pass along, then my living shall not be in vain." And that is also very much a part of, you know, my beloved fraternity, Phi Mu Alpha, Symphonia Fraternity of America. You know, one of the tenets being the advancement of music in America. And that is what, and I think about it beyond, we have some music in America and beyond. Like that is what we, that is what we are, that we're called to do. And so in whatever way I do it, whether it is, you know, through as an educator, whether it's on an AGT stage, what have you, I have to advance the cause of music, of art, of creativity, of service of of of, of agency mm. to everyone that um, everyone that I'm called and encountered to to see. Yeah, yeah well, that is very powerful. Thank you. I feel like I mean I'm sure it's just a, a drop in the bucket, but I've learned so much <laughs> about the history of it. So thank you, and and also just like the teacher, what you're you're mentioning, he just really empowered you to do so many things. I feel like so many doors. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned, you know, your career has been this kind of untraditional, but that's, I think there's so much beauty in that too. That's just like, not this, and uh, now you go to this college and you go to this young artist program. And when it feels like, you, you know, you're following your musical heritage, it's so unique. And again, it's authentic. And that's why probably people resonate so much with you is because they, they feel it. They feel that your desire for service and everything. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, okay. This has been a delight. Um, <laughs> let me ask you really quickly as our final question. I feel like you'll have to come back so we can chat more. But um, what are the, some of the things you're looking for? This will air uh, in January. But tell us about the end of your December season and then some of the things you're looking forward to in 2023. Thank you. So let me pull it up, actually, when you're asking that. So you guys are going to get first scoop. This is great. Um, Ooh, nice. So let's see, I'm looking forward to a few things. So the, so right now I'm back in the Maryland area, what we call the DMV, the Maryland DC area. Uh, this coming weekend, December 10th and 11th, I'm singing, I'm the counter of soloist for Handel's Messiah with the Handel Choir of Baltimore. Next week, I am singing with uh, a group out of DC called The 13, a very, very, really great um, 
uh, choral, uh, choir, orchestra, sort of early music, uh, and, uh, and a concert group, the 13, uh, doing Vivaldi's Gloria and Bach's Magnificat as ensemble and soloists. And then that's the end of that season. And then I'm just going to hang out a little bit before Christmas. And then... Uh, well deserved. <laughs> well deserved because it's been a... And right, so I would also say this sort of to tie in, right? Right before this, right before I got to the DMV, I was in Chicago I would, where I was covering the alto and tenor parts in the gospel jazz Messiah, Too Hot to Handle. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Which, which actually ties back to some of my Morgan traditions as well. And I did get to, I didn't go on like for one of those parts, I had to go on to do some other things in the show. So that was cool. So I still, you know, was featured there. Um, and then I, before Thanksgiving, I was in a, uh, in a concert curated by uh, soprano Adrian Danrich um, with American Opera Projects. So, and back in New York. So that was cool. Uh, in the spring, Let's see, there are things that, I'm also a co-founder of a group called Early Music City, a progressive early music ensemble, which um, again, is sort of like demystifying, declassifying what opera, what early music is. Mm. Um, this is early, like what is Nashville's early music? What is the early music of indigenous people, of, of, of the black community, of, of uh, the Latinx community, et cetera. So we have some things coming up at the top of uh, January. Uh, the Crimp Singers have things at the top of January for King Day in Nashville, of course. Uh, I'll be, so we're gonna be, yeah, that's that. I will be in on January 19th. I'm gonna be in Aurora, Illinois at Aurora, Aurora University for the Majesty of the Spiritual concert um, curated by Robert Sims, baritone, very renowned for uh, spirituals himself uh go to la to do a album release for uh what's called emancipation act two uh okay. led by adrian dunn uh so that's going to be at the colburn school um let's see what else i'm there's something else i'm going to be back with the 13 for at least two dates in the spring i'm making my strathmore hall debut solo debut i should say um with Washington Bach Consort singing Messiah again in March of next year. Uh, we have our Harry T. Burley Spirituals Festival at Tennessee State, in, which is also in partnership with the National Museum of African American Music and the Country Music Hall of Fame. Our theme for the Burley Festival, which will be March 25th and 26th, is uh, Rooted, the Negro Spiritual as, America, as Early Music, as Americana, Gospel, Roots Gospel, and Country Music. Uh, so we're going to be having our concert at the Country Music Hall of Fame CMA Theater on oh, nice. Sunday, March 26th. Uh, so that's exciting. Uh, I will be singing a role in the world premiere of Hannibal Lukumbe's, uh The Jonah People, A Legacy of Struggle and Triumph uh, with the Nashville Symphony. And uh, that's basically it. Well, that's that cool. is a lot. So, <laughs> and So, and of course, still teaching. <laughs> Uh, and uh, doing again, doing things with the Crim Singers, things with Early Music City. I'm very excited about, as much as I love uh, working, oh, I guess I could mention that too. As much as I love working um, with other groups and things, I'm also most, you know, what really excites me is, you know, being able to sort of do the programs that, that you love and that are your baby, right? Um, so, the Burley Festival is big for me and our community in the village. The Crim Singers Ventures, Early Music City Ventures. Um, I will say too, starting in January, I will be also, if, as if I don't have anything else to do, I will also be the president of the International Farmers Price Festival, also known oh, as wow. Fest. Um, so I'll be beginning that term. So pray for me. Um, <laughs> there's a lot happening, but yeah. So. Um, yeah, I'm just grateful again to be able to do all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, uh, being in Nashville is great because you know you have access to doing session work too. And, um, an album that myself and the Crim Singers worked on, um, I was, I was brought into so, like so the uh, that the Crim Singers got to be on, uh, as a featured part, and then I, I arranged. 
and I never thought of myself, somebody who failed theory two or three times. Um, <laughs> I can't believe that I'm now sitting here like, oh, I'm arranging things. Like I've, I have like three or four arrangements that I've done now. I was like, oh, great, okay. Um, but not to go off on a tangent, but I feel like I have some of the friends, like I did well in theory, but I don't feel like I understood it. Some of my friends didn't do well, but like they're geniuses at it. So I don't think it's a good measure of... <laughs> It's not, and I've come to realize, I remember I was working with another student. He was like, I don't understand this. And I was like, well, think about this. Like, did you think about the choir? Did you just think this? And so when you hear that, that's that. And he's like, oh, and I hit up one of my frat brothers who is like a really, who's a composer and great uh, with theory. Uh, his name is Colin Lett, fabulous composer. He's written a lot of stuff that, and he's, uh, he and I collaborate a lot. And I said, bro, I just explained this thing to this boy in theory. And he was like, <laughs> Who would have thought? Because he knows the struggle. But uh, so now, I, but I sat there in the studio and I heard the thing and I said, okay, I arranged it and I vocal. Um, so I vocal, I did the arrangement of the parts, taught it to the group uh, and vocal produced our section. And then I did some other layered vocals on top of it. And so now uh, that track on that album is nominated for a Grammy. It's called the Urban Hymnal. Wow. Okay. Um, by the Tennessee State University Marching Band. It is the first, the Tennessee State University Marching Band is the first, H, was firmly, really the first university marching band to be nominated for a Grammy. Uh, and it is in the Roots Gospel category. Um, it's produced by uh, Sir the Baptist and uh, Dallas Austin, uh, our, you know, featuring some gospel heavy hitters, featuring again, a lot of our, the own, our own Tennessee State University aristocratic bands, uh, the New Direction Gospel Choir, Tennessee State University, the world, I'm sorry, the award-winning New Direction Gospel Choir of Tennessee State University, um, the W Crim Singers, aka Wakanda Corral. Uh, so we're not, so that album is nominated for a Grammy. Um, Amazing. And it's cool, you know, again, just being up, being featured on different projects. This is this project that from Urban Hymnal to Emancipation, um, Act two, then I, what's the other one I'm on? I'm on, um, I'm featured on the uh, the self-titled album from the Aeolians of Oakwood University under the direction of Dr. Jason Max Ferdinand. Uh, I'm featured on the, the debut album of Lewis York, um, Chuck Harmony and Claude Kelly, two super producers, their album, American Griots. And there's a documentary that I was in as a feature performer uh, from Ben Greger out of a UK based filmmaker uh, called uh, Fatherhood that's been on Fuse TV as well. So, you know, I, I just get to do different things. I get to be opera guy and new music guy. I've like world premiered a number of pieces, opera and new music guy, early music guy, um, gospel guy when you want me to, crossover guy when you want me to. Yep. Conductor guy, when you want me to, uh, teacher guy, you know, family guy. I don't know, but <laughs> wearing many hats there. Many hats. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you again so much, Patrick. I really appreciate you coming on and chatting with me. This has just thank been you. delightful. Thank you so much. My absolute pleasure.